Welcome to another episode of Fill in the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Evan. Fueled with caffeine. Fueled with caffeine and good intentions, hopefully. So, we're here to talk about Project 4.1. What comes to your mind when I say Project 4.1? Well, all these fucking project names, you know, kind of meant to be. So, are we talking government Opaque. or uh, volunteer services? Definitely government. Project 4.1 is... You don't believe it's an organization like... Uh, you know how Project Sunshine, if, if you look up anything <laughs> like Project Sunshine, instead of getting the government conspiracy, you get a, a little something of a bunch of kids planting trees. I don't think Project so, 4.1... Sounds like a, like, like, like a Christian group or something, you know? Yeah, helping hands. Well, Project 4.1 was the designation for a medical study conducted by the United States of those residents of the Marshall Islands exposed to radioactive fallout Two. from the March 1st, 1954 Caste Bravo nuclear test at Bikini Atoll, so which had an unexpectedly large yield. Government and mainstream historical sources point to the study being organized on March 6th or March 7th, 1954, six days after the Bravo shot. Now, does Project 4.1 sound anything like um, basically a study testing the uh, residents of Marshall Islands because of radioactive fallout? When you get a name like that, it's kind of, you kind of assume it's supposed to be like, it sounds normal, right? Just like Project 4.1, you know, nothing nothing special, you know, not, not trying to figure out if uh, the U.S. government... Uh, fucked over a bunch of people who did nothing wrong, you know? I'm curious on to, where do they come up with these operation names? Ugh, I don't know. Pro probably, there might be some kind of system for it, but I imagine it, there's a possibility that it's just like a commander, you know? Yeah. Being like, yeah, I like that name. Fuck it. <laughs> so, even after the launch, there was still time to evacuate citizens before impact, but would hinder results. So the whole, these are my little notes I scribbled down. Um, basically, like, they had time to warn these people at the time of the launch, like, when they were going to launch this stuff, but they left them there because they wanted to see what would happen um, with, like, being able to test them. So they basically bombed a place, and then they were like, all right, we're just not going to tell the people. Like, they, they would have had time to evacuate even after they launched it. Yeah. Um, many children suffered from birth defect problems with their uh, genetics. Um, and this is also a so-called accident was used to, um, they chalked it up to wind misdirection of the nuke. So they launched a nuke and then everyone found out that the government, you know, was doing all this and they knew about it and they had it planned out and everything. And they were like, oh, it was a misdirection. It was really supposed to strike an island off the coast and not affect you guys. But the wind pushed our nuke a little bit farther over. That sounds like some government made up excuse, man. So, let's talk about the establishment and secrecy of the project. In the wake of the Caste Bravo detonation, a new research section was added to the Caste Bravo Weapons Effects Research Section. Program 4, Biomedical Effects, was to include one project, Project 4.1, titled Study of Response of Human Beings Exposed to Significant Beta and Gamma Radiation Due to Fallout from High Yield Weapons written by Eugene P. Cronkite of the National Narval Medical Center, was designated as project officer. Cronkite's instructions stressed the importance of secrecy surrounding the project. Now, for everyone out there, it's not Walter Cronkite. It is a different Cronkite. So the project, this is what he um, wrote on the, the instructions for the project. He said, the project is classified secret restricted data due to possible adverse public reaction. You will specify and instruct all personnel in this project to be particularly careful not to discuss the purpose of this project and its backgrounds or findings, with any except for those who have specific need-to-know basis. So the purpose of the project, as a 1982 Defense Nuclear Agency report explained, was both medical as well for research purposes. The purpose of Project 4.1 were to, one, evaluate the severity of radiation injury to the human beings exposed, two, provide for all necessary medical care, and three, conduct a scientific study of radiation injuries to human beings. 
Do you think, because it's kind of a little bit similar like Project Sunshine where we tested on dead bodies, but now it's like we're just going to find another group of people that are is not are not what we see as uh, Americans, like a different culture, and just bomb them because it doesn't... Do you think it takes the stigma out of it? Like, if we bombed our own people, do you think it's because they look like us? Like, that's why I think racism is so... A, it's a giant thing. We're able to test people that don't really look or have similarities to us. Like, if you think about what we did to China or, like, the Russians, we didn't do as bad to the Russians as, you know, I mean, what we did still pretty on both sides. But, um, like, when it comes to, like, what we have done, like, with Phoenix Program and, like, all this stuff where, you know, we're focused on, like, torturing with eels and all these different types of things. Like, we see them as a little bit less of humans because of just how they look. Well, <clears throat> you're in the position to authorize this kind of operation. You want to... Do you think the need to scientifically test the effects on, like, a real group of humans just to, like, know what to prepare for or how to fight against it if it happens to any, like, Americans. It's it's very easy to imagine some scientist or commander making the decision that it's worth casting aside these random people that no one will really care about this small Indeed. group of people yeah, on one island. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's easy to see a commander putting uh, the need for that knowledge to prepare, like, Americans over the lives of these people that will be ruined. We have to think. I, I believe it's like the further our looks are different from one another, we just tend to ignore the humanity or, like, you know, we can just easily chalk it up to it's in the benefit of research. You know, how many times has the government said that over one of their projects? It was in benefit for our knowledge. We needed to know. Yeah, it might have been necessary. You know, like it's good that we have that information now, but it just sucks that we had to do something so extreme to come to that. Especially bombing an island. Like, holy crap. Like, that's not something that's, you know, it's not really like, you know, if you drop something on the ground <laughs> on accident. It's not really... A giant little uh, mistake. That's a big one right there. And to the the racism point, like, yeah, 1950s, farther back you go, more likely it is that, like, yeah. Yeah, it definitely. Like, white, white people in a position of power in America will... Not just whites, though. It would be the yeah, same thing just, from another culture. You're, yeah, you're like on a different any, spectrum looking in. Anyone in a position of power looking at a uh, group of people, not you, you know, easier to... E easier to live with dropping a nuke on them and seeing what happens to them than it would be, like, like if, if you did the same thing on, like, a small town in, like, isolated America, you know? Well, let's talk about preparation of the project. As a Department of Energy committee writing on the human radiation experiments wrote, it appears to have been almost immediately apparent to the AEC and the Joint Task Force running the Castell series that research on radiation effects could be done in conjunction with the medical treatment of the exposed populations. The DOE report also concluded that the dual purpose of what is now a DOE medical program has led to a view by the Marshallese that they were being used as guinea pigs in a radiation experiment. Organizations involved in the project included the Naval Medical Research Institute, the Naval Radiological Defense Laboratory Patrol Squadron 29, the Naval Air Station Kwajan and Los Alamos National Laboratory. They were all three um, and other U.S. Navy ships used in the project, such as the USS Nicholas, USS Renshaw, and USS Phillip. The primary study of the Marshallese was terminated around 75 days after the time of exposure. In July 1954, a meeting at the Division of Biology at the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission decided to complete six- and 12-month follow-up exposure studies, some of which were later written up as amendments to Project 4.1. So let's talk about the intentionality of this project. So the, on the Marshall Islands, the indigenous population is also known as the Marshallese. So when they reference that, you just know what they're talking about. Yeah. So Marshallese have alleged that the exposure of the, of the Marshallese was pre-emidated. In 1972, 
uh, Micronesian representative Achat Balos charged at the Congress of Micronesia that the exposure during Bravo was purposeful so that the AEC could develop medical capabilities for treating those exposed to fallout during nuclear war and charged that the AEC could develop, um, basically they were chosen on marginal status in the world at large. So, like we said, where it seems like it's a little bit less of a stigma to bomb somebody that doesn't look like us or so yeah. different, that's what the, he, he even came to that conclusion. Now, when it says that they're just, they're testing on better ways to treat people with radioactive fallout, does that make the project acceptable if you say it like that? I mean... Obviously not. Because, we you know, if we get bombed, we like to know how to treat our own people. But exactly. Why would we go but. and bomb somebody else just to be able to get better research? That's where it is a benefit that, you know, these things did happen. That that but That's it, probably why they were able to justify it to themselves, you know? Yeah. Because, yeah, now, now we know if we have any capability of dealing with a nuclear fallout that... Yeah, we have procedures now that are in place to help taxpaying Americans. <laughs> well, if you, look at, if you look in the eyes of humanity, it's seen as wrong. But if you look in the eyes of like further research and development of our country and our government, then it's a it's a benefit. Just because you know we need to know this research, like we need to know, you know how how fast like when we perform surgeries or something you need to know like how long does a person have usually like how long does a typical person last with their leg chopped off without yeah. getting something to stop the blood well besides making these people uh guinea pigs it's he literally said according to a u.s internal transcription of ballos talk ballos alleged that the u.s chose to make guinea pigs out of people because they are not white but some brown natives in remote pacific islands Medical treatment that Ronald G. Laps and Yurchkrees have been receiving is also highly questionable. The AEC issued a staff comment denying these charges. In 1994, a 1953 Caste Bravo program, um, Prospetics was found, which included reference to Project 4.1. Apparently written before the Bravo shot had occurred, the U.S. government responded that someone had gone back into the project list after the Bravo test to insert Project 4.1. Thus, according to the U.S. government, the acts were not premeditated. All other U.S. documents point to Project 4.1 as having been established after the Bravo test. Most sources point to its having been organized on March 7, 1954. The final Project 4.1 report began in its preface with the statement that Operation Castle did not include a biomedical program. It mentioned this in discussing the ad hoc nature by which the project personnel were assembled. All official and mainstream historical accounts of the Bravo test indicate that it's at a high level of fallout was a result of miscalculation in relation to its design and was not deliberate. So then it's been where I talk about the wind direction. There's been multiple um, things they chalk up to the design of the missile and also the design of like just how the day was planned out. Like certain weather things occurred and then this anomaly happened, you know? Yeah. Well, Barton C. Hacker, the official historian of the U.S. nuclear testing exposure, who is in the end very critical for the U.S. in handling the Bravo incident, categorized the controversy in the following way. In March 1954, the AEC had quickly decided that learning how the Marshallese victims of Castle Bravo responded to their accidental exposure could be of immense medical and military value. Imme immediately, action centered on seeing them evacuated and decontaminated, then cared for medically, but studies of their bodies and exposures in the after effects also began. The effort became Project 4.1 in the Castle Experimental Program, this unfortunate choice of terminology may help explain later charges that the AEC had deliberately exposed the Marshallese to these observed effects. Like the American radium dial painters of the 1920s and the Japanese of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, the Marshallese of 1954 inadvertently were able to provide otherwise unobtainable data on the human consequences of high radiation exposures. Findings from Project 4.1 soon began to appear in print. 
So he's literally saying it ha had research value to the military. Like he straight up came out and said that. Like, all right, guys, you know, we did this. Yeah, it's 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 bad, but you know, we needed to know these things because we needed to know how to be able to treat people at the same time. It's not he doesn't look like you, so it shouldn't matter. It is very lucky for a United States that is heading straight long into a uh, cold war where. Either side could throw a nuke at the other and blast an entire town out of the, out of, off the fucking map. You know, it's lucky that uh that accident happened so we can get that data. You know, I wouldn't really call it an accident. Yeah, they it doesn't, pur they purposely did. Hindsight this like doesn't seem like one. Just it just doesn't. So. Well, their excuse was it was an accident, but it, you know, then later they came out saying that you know it happened. It's not. It wasn't really whether you want to blame us or not. Like it, it happened. We'll take the blame, but you know, we needed to know these things. So controversy continues. However, fed by the legacy of mistrust sown by American nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands, which involved relocating hundreds of people and rendering several atolls uninhabitable. While most sources do not think that the exposure was intentional, there is no dispute that the United States did carefully study the exposed Marshallese, but never obtained informed consent from the study subjects. The study of the Marshallese was in some case beneficial for their treatment, and in other cases not. In these ways, the study of the exposed Marshallese reflects the same ethical lapses that were undertaken in other aspects of secret human radiation experiments conducted by the Atomic Energy Commission in the 1940s and 1950s. This all came to light only after the end of the Cold War. It seemed like we had a bigger problem with radiation testing during the Cold War when we were diving, I guess, more into the realms of nuclear activity. But like the same thing with the Cecil Kelly into the Project Sunshine incident. We went from testing dead bodies to testing alive ones. But when they were treating these people, they wouldn't really be treating them in the proper way. They'd be seeing how long these people had these effects. And then, you know, if the people were starting to get like suspicious, they'd treat them. But not in the proper way to do it. Like if someone like cuts their finger, you would be like hold on, we need to clean it out, wrap it up, and do everything, like the steps, you would get, you would be immediately on it, like especially if it was a bad cut. And then it seemed like this one, they were like, let's see how long it kind of bleeds before it stops, let's see how their effects last the next couple hours. Like they're slowly, it's like when at work, when people do a slowdown, it's like doing that. Like, yeah. like, yeah, treat them at like half speed. So let's talk about the results about the effects of this uh, nuclear test. According to the final project 4.1 report, the Bravo test exposed 239 Marshallese on the Ultric Rondelap and Archina Atolls to significant level of radiation, and 28 Americans stationed on the Rognac Atoll were so exposed, these on the Rognac Atoll were most seriously affected, receiving approximately 175 rads of radiation before they were evacuated. Those on the Algenese received 69 rads, and those on the Ultric received 14 rads. And the Americans on Ragnarok received a average dose of 78 rads. The results of the original project were published by the study authors in professional medical journals in 1955. It's pretty rad. Such as the, that's pretty rad, you get all those <laughs> rads, bro. Dude, sick. So in 2010, it was calculated that the subpopulation, the projected portion of cancers attributable to radiation from fallout from all nuclear tests conducted in the Marshall Islands is 55%, with a 28% to 69% uncertainty range. Among 82 persons exposed in 1954 at the atoll and the other atoll were diagnosed with cancer. Wow. So they're literally telling you from the 55% of the people that were affected by this radiation developed cancer. So there's your, uh, it, here's your evidence right there that cancer is linked to radiation. Well, cancer is just a um, mutation that, like, gets out of hand in your body, you know? One of the normal processes gets fucked up by something, so... Well, it can get it can happen on its own naturally, but besides developing the obvious cancer, what would else would you suspect that they would have if they're getting sick to all this radiation? I don't know, man. Radiation is just like 
Well, most individuals it fucks with exposed, organic matter. Most individuals exposed did not immediately show signs of radiation sickness. Though within a few days after effects of significant radiation exposure manifested, loss of hair, significant skin damage, including raw, weeping lesions among the Rongelap and Alginid population groups, the, le the lesions healed quickly. However, consistent with radiation exposure, the report abstracted concluded that estimates of total body burden indicate that there is no long-term hazard. So they said it was more like short-term effects among at least all of the population that were affected, besides the people that eventually got cancer. So with the follow-up checks in the Marsh Lee studied in Project 4.1 were conducted at regular intervals afterwards every single day since 1954. Though the Marsh Lee's experienced far, far milder immediate effects than the Japanese fishermen exposed to Bravo fallout on the fishing boat Duego Porco Maru, the long-term effects were pronounced as they depended largely on subsistence living and were relocated to the site of the testing in Bikini. Um, so, I mean, after all this exposures, the, the first four decades after the test, the effects were ambiguous and statistically difficult to correlate the radiation exposure. Miscarriages and stillbirths among exposed women doubled in the first five years after the accident, but then returned to normal. Some developmental difficulties and impaired growth appeared in children, but in no clear-cut pattern. In the decades that followed through, the effects were undeniable. Children began to suffer disproportionately from thyroid cancer due to exposure to radio iodines, and almost a third of those exposed developed neoplasms by 1974. So the population that's coming later that weren't even affected by the bomb are still affected because they have their parents are have that radiation in them. It's not the radiation's not gone out of the person. So then these babies that are being born are being born with defects. Imagine you aren't even alive when this happens, then you're born into the world and there's something wrong permanently with you that's going to mess you up and make a, like a crippling handicap in a way for the rest of your life because some government wanted to test something out. <sighs> Genetic disorders are the most... Um... We don't need to go into a whole thing about yeah. genetic disorders, but just... I it's, wanna... it's, it's possibly the most tragic human condition. Like... Born, but physically how do you handicapped. Think these people apart from the rest of the decided world decided you know? these projects. How do you think these people are like even able to function, like live on, knowing that they've just ruined future generations of like people that are being born? Imagine a baby's born, and it's your fault the kid can't see, or it's your fault the kid has no arms, or it's your fault that the kid you know can't walk right. It's like people like that they probably continue on using the same justification to themselves that let them yeah, but eventually, detonate it in the first place, you know, that it's the information was necessary. Or it could have all been an accident. Eventually. I but mean, assuming Chinese it wasn't an accident. Chinese cheese bagel is going to be a little bit difficult after a while, like 10 years down the road, it's constantly weighing on your mind. Chinese that bagel is going to be a little bit difficult. You know? Yeah. I mean, that bite's not going to taste the same. One day it's just going to change because you're going to be, it's the same people that go and kill all these people in war. Like they don't stop seeing those people's faces a lot of the times. And it's like, yeah, there might be days where you totally ignore the fact that it happened, but it's always going to be in the back of your mind. It's something that you did. And just knowing that these people could muster up in the courage and then kind of hide behind their excuse of, oh, it being in research value. They... You know, some people say that the advancement of a society is measured in the value placed on the individual life. You reach for some big-ass words when you do these <laughs> podcasts. So, like, what, what, when focus shifts from the value of the, hum, the human race towards the human, how each individual life is important and valuable and priceless it's obvious that we weren't there we're definitely not there now but like it's put into stark so what contrast you... when you see people that fucking just say yeah like we could use that information what, uh what would fuck you, them what would you say is that project beneficial or not obviously the information is beneficial but i don't if you were in the, the hands the the 
the information is just clearly not worth the cost. It's, well, that's just obvious. Anybody that wants to do research more on radiation or Project 4.1, um, I definitely suggest looking it up. It's definitely, there's a lot of archived article stuff. The only uh, bad part is it's, you know, a lot of it's limited because of our Information Act. It doesn't really work until 20 years after the person's dead. And this still has a little bit of information, but you got to dig down for it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the podcast and uh, we'll see you on the next episode.